So um, I'm Amanda Gumbert. Um, I know most of you, I think, that are on the webinar today, um, and I've probably worked with a lot of you. So I'm going to talk about um, working with Cooperative Extension as a watershed partner. Um, so just as an overview, um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the land grant mission and some history. I've always found it very fascinating, and Alan, I found yours very fascinating as a, as a soil nerd. Um, but also I want to talk about the Cooperative Extension structure and some of our programs, and then a little more specifically about relevant services that would be helpful in watershed projects, and then finally, how to best work with Extension. So the land-grant universities have a three-part mission. It has a research, education, and extension. So research is the part of the university that most of us think of that happens in laboratories, or for those of us in the ag community, we think about it going on um, farms. And um, that's exactly what that is. So we're investigating and trying to answers to big questions. Um, the other part, or one of the other parts, is education. And so that's the traditional in-classroom type of scenario that we see think about and or remotely as we did this spring uh, in terms of training the next generation of scientists and educators and citizens um, but then finally the third part is extension and that's where those of us who have extension appointments take the knowledge that we generate on campus and within the um, research and education community we take that out to the people of the so a little history um, of the land grants. Um, in 1862, uh, Justin Morrill wrote uh, the act that established land grant universities. And so this was going on right in the, during the Civil War. And it was a, really the first opportunity for working class folks in, the, in America to get an education. So that was a, an extremely important move. And then in 1890, the second Morrill Act was passed, and that not only um, added funding to make sure that these land-grant universities were able to function well, but also added our historically black institutions. And so we together work as a cooperative uh, organization. <clears throat> and also in 1994, the Equity and Educational Land Grant Status Act added tribal colleges. So those are three different layers of um, institutions. And sometimes within land-grant universities, you'll hear us use this language of 1862 or 1890 institutions or 1994 institutions. But just keep in mind that all of those institutions that are under the land-grant blanket, um, we all work together. And so in Kentucky, the University of Kentucky is our 1862 institution. And Kentucky State University is our 1890 institution. So we do work together uh, to really complete those three missions of land. Um, in 1897, the Hatch Act added uh, the research component. So previously, the Morrill Act, um, those two acts really were for education. And research was added through the Hatch Act, and that added our experiment stations. And then finally, in 1914, the Smith-Lever Act created the Cooperative Extension Service. So we had the education piece, we had the research piece, and so then in 1914, we got the outreach piece. Um, and so I don't know if anybody noticed our um, photograph to the right, but um, I found that historic um, photo, and it says gangsters in the grass. So it's education about noxious weeds. So some of you plant folks might appreciate that. So the mission of the Kentucky Cooperative Extension Service is to serve as a link between the counties of the Commonwealth and the state's land-grant universities to help people improve their lives through an educational process focusing on their issues and needs. Um, and Steve um, mentioned the structure a little bit about um, Cooperative Extension in terms of having um, boards, um, district boards, uh, having that local governance, but then we also have direction that comes from the university. Um, so there's lots of different uh, things at play in how Cooperative Extension is working. But we have um, 120 county offices, so one in each of our counties. And we have multiple areas of programming that are covered through those county offices. 
So Ag and Natural Resources is probably the most um, applicable to watershed planning, um, but don't discount the other areas. So Ag and Natural Resources will include livestock, crops, forestry, horticulture, um, those type of issues. Um, family and Consumer Sciences will um, include topics like um, healthy lifestyles, um, managing family finance, maybe food preparation or food preservation. Uh, but don't discount family and consumer sciences is also a potential way to um, get an audience that is looking at water issues from the consumer side of things. Um, also, we have 4-H youth development, and the areas that are most applicable are the natural resources content area that, um, that our agents will provide programming for, um, and then also our environmental camps. Many of our 4-H uh, camps and, and counties have environmental camps that happen during the traditional school year where um, campers, I think typically fourth graders, will go to an overnight um, day and they will focus on just environmental topics. So that's a really great opportunity if you have a watershed project in that local area or working with your local county office that you can um, provide that information as part of their environmental camp and make it much more specific. We also have agents that um, work on community and economic development. And then also, most recently, we've added fine arts into the areas of programming. And we have several counties who have fine arts agents and also have a specialist on camp that works with those counties. So I've talked a little bit about our county agents and made a couple of references to an extension specialist. And so I want to make sure that you understand the difference. So our county extension agents work only in their assigned county. Sometimes if we have an, a vacancy, we may have an agent who will serve um, across the border in multiple counties just for a short period of time. But as of now, we still have agents that are assigned only to one county. But they cover many topics. So keep that in mind also, that sometimes they're, they're spread pretty thin in terms of covering all of the topics that might be of interest to their clientele within their county. Um, at least two um, agents are present in each county. Those primary areas that are covered are Ag and Natural Resources, and also Family and Consumer Sciences. And then we, some of you are probably familiar that we have additional agents in a lot of counties, and that's when we utilize county funds to add on those additional agents. Um, it's not quite um, evenly spread across the counties, and, and probably um, a lot like what Alan was indicating with conservation districts. Um, some of our counties only have two agents, and then some of our counties may have 12 agents. It, a lot of it depends on the fund they have available, and some of those county funds are generated through tax revenue. Um, so we have county agents that are at the local level, and then we have state staff. And th those state staff serve the entire state, but focus on one or um, focused topic. And so there are extension specialists like myself, uh, and I, so I serve the whole state, but I really focus on agricultural water quality topics. Uh, and then we have Extension Associates, and I think Suzette Walling is um, on here, and, and she's an Extension Associate working on some specific topics. Um, but then also Tammy Barnes, some of you have worked with Tammy, Grant Management Planner. Tammy is an Extension Associate also, and she focuses on grant management plan development and for utilization from a water quality perspective. So um, just to let you know, those are the two different structures, but we all are available to participate in watershed-related projects. So I just want to take um, some time to talk about some specific extension resources that might be helpful in watershed projects. And something I might point out is in, in a lot of the photographs that I'm using, you'll notice there's lots of people around some of us at this point that, you know, we can longingly look at those pictures of, oh, wow, that's when we could get together and do um, group learning. But um, Extension really is focused on people, 
and meeting the needs of people, and that goes back to our mission. And so um, I think you'll find that most of us who work for Extension are pretty passionate about that and want to get the information out to the people. So um, some of the services that we offer through our Extension offices that are related, um, first and foremost, soil testing. Most of you might be familiar with um, soil testing, but that is a service that we offer. Some of our county offices partner with their local conservation district or other organization and help to offset the cost for soil sampling. But it's important for our producers, um, large-scale farmers, small farmers, even um, citizens, residents who maybe just have a small yard, to know what their, their fertilizer needs are for their lawn. Um, or for their fields before they apply lime and fertilizer. So um, that has a direct water quality benefit. So we strongly encourage anybody um, who's applying fertilizer to take a soil sample and make sure they know what they need. You can contact the local extension office for soil sample collection bags and also details on how to collect those samples. We also offer animal waste testing, so this goes hand in hand with uh, developing nutrient management plans um, and utilizing um, animal waste, not as a waste product, but um, as a source of nutrient. So through our um, regulatory services office on campus, uh, our scientists can analyze the um, animal manure that's collected on farm and let our farmers know what the nutrient samples are. So you could just contact the extension office for um, sample collection details. And then um, some water testing. We get a lot of calls uh, from folks wanting to know if extension does water testing. And we don't do widespread water testing, but there are options for testing irrigation water in terms of nutrient content for that irrigation water. But not for livestock drinking and not for um, Finally, I want to mention, again, the community development aspect. Um, we have um, faculty and staff that are in our leadership development department that can help with facilitation. And I know sometimes with watershed planning, and many of you as watershed planners, this probably falls to you as um, part of your job responsibility. But sometimes it's helpful to have somebody from the outside come in and facilitate a contentious issue or discussion. And we do offer some of those services through our development department. So um, asking somebody at the extension office for a referral to a specialist would be the best way to go to get that information. So some of our facilities that are available, um, I mentioned we have county offices. So that's uh, red meeting space. So some of you watershed groups might need a space to meet or to hold a workshop or a class or something like that. Um, I'll give you a, a helpful hint on county office space, and that is to make friends with the folks who are um, working the front desk that are our staff members. They are the ones who are at the county offices all the time. They usually receive soil samples and process the paperwork for that, um, and they will know all the ins and outs of what goes on at the office. So as a specialist, I make sure that, um, that I know, when I, if I need meeting space, that I know who to call and to try to get help that way. Um, those folks are, are really the gatekeepers for, for county offices. So there, some of our offices are small, though, so keep that not all of our offices We have um, one county in particular in northern Kentucky that has very elaborate meeting space, and in contrast, we have other small counties that just have office space for their agents, and no, so it's kind of a bit of across the board. Um, we also have, um, as part of our Ag Experiment Station, we have multiple research facilities. So one is the Central Kentucky Farms, and that um, has three different farm properties, one being the North Farm, that's along I-75 and I-64, and some you've met along the way, if you've passed through there on the interstate, that's the North Farm. We also have the Orrin Little Research Center in Woodford County. That's where most of our livestock 
um, practices are and experiments are done held out there. Eden Shale Farm is in Owen County. It's also a livestock operation and picture to the bottom right of the screen was taken there at Eden Shale. And so there are lots of practices that are installed there that um, have been done in the last several years and are um, very practical applications and see knows that uh, it's a great place to, to see some practices utilized on the farm beef operation. We also have the horticulture research farm that is located in Fayette County in Lexington. Organic operation and they have a variety of research projects there. The Robinson Center for Appalachian Resource and Sustainability is located in Quicksand, Kentucky. That's near Jackson. Uh, that center um, also is the hub for Robinson Forest, uh, also the Wood Utilization Center. So if you're interested in different practices related to timber harvest and streamside management zone, Robinson Forest may offer that um, as a, a place for seeing those demonstrations. They typically have a field day every September, and um, so if that's if you're working in that area of the state, that would be a great place to to partner with to be part of display or offer a class or something like that. It brings in folks from Eastern Kentucky to the community. Uh, it's an outreach opportunity. And then finally, we have the Research and Education Center at Princeton, where um, we also have our Grain and Forages Center of Excellence. They have recently remodeled that facility, the meeting space available there. I've, it's very new. I've not used it at all yet, and, but they also have on-farm research and typically have um, production-related field days that could also be an opportunity to partner there. So Paulette mentioned the Ag Water Quality Act. Um, I also want to share with you that Extension has resources available for helping farmers um, develop ag water quality plans or for helping you as a watershed coordinator learn those. Uh, our website is listed here. Uh, <clears throat> on the website, we have a producer's workbook, uh, have, uh, the, state, um, the state plan for the Ag Water Quality Act. Um, and we also have calculators, tools, and, and resources for learning about it. In the center of the screen, you'll see a screenshot of a video that we produced with John Bonarski, and he's a beef operator in Kentucky. And so we have a series of videos that you'll hear directly from farmers on how they are practices from their ag water quality plans. And I'm just really... Um, Really pleased to, to show those, and I think it's helpful when you're working with ag community that farmers talk to farmers. Um, Steve mentioned um, way back a few uh, webinars ago about some work that um, I've participated in with 46 and working with the uh, Mississippi River Basin Initiative. And we do believe and know from research that farmers talking to farmers is much more effective than farmers hearing watershed practitioners or farm, and sometimes farm advisors are just as effective, but um, farmer to farmer communication is very important, especially related to conservation. I um, also want to point you to the University of Kentucky College of Agriculture Food and Environments publication catalog. Um, this is a great resource for identifying specific information related to different practices. You can search this page. Um, it's kind of this is kind of the the backdoor catalog of, of publications of uh, tons and tons of topics. But um, there is a search bar there, and you can search for specific um, things that you might be looking for for a livestock operation or crop operation or riparian buffer planting, those kind of things. If you happen to know the author, you can search by the author. You can find these um, publications here. You can make PDF files. You can print them. You can distribute them. All of those that are available are available for you to distribute as well. Uh, some of them print don't print as nicely because we maybe formatted them for specialty printing. So if you have trouble with that, uh, feel free to reach out to me. And I, um, 
just want to share with you a couple of other resources we have available. We have a Backyard Streams program that uh, Dr. Carmen Agarinas and I developed and work on publication that you see here on the screen. That's um, also available through that um, publication uh, hub that you can download. But it is one of those that it looks nicer if you print it in color and typically try to print it on slick paper. So if you need multiple copies of that and you want a little more appealing, you know, maybe grab people's attention, let me know. But the Backyard Streams program is really focused for those folks who have streams in their yard, adjacent to their yard. They can be urban residents. They could also be rural residents. Just focused on educating people about um, how they take care of their streams and how they can be good stewards. So we have an online course and offer workshops if that's something that folks are interested in. Wanted to show you what the modules or what the um, online course looks like. It's a, a, a set of 12 online modules, and um, so it's on a Canvas platform. It's free. Sign up and take the course. And you go through each 12 of the 12 modules. Uh, each one has a pre-recorded um, PowerPoint and as well as a quiz at the end. And when you pass all of those 12 modules, you get a certificate that you are a certified backyard stream steward. And so we have um, a number of folks who've completed that. It's really um, great information for folks who want to learn more about their streams, but they don't really know where to go. Uh, some of it is general information. Some of it's a little more technical and detailed, but there is supporting information. And you can get transcripts. You can download the slides. And, kind of and then finally, I want to um, point you to our water podcast. Um, KYH2O and Carmen and I host this podcast and work with Brian Ballin. Um, so we try to um, focus on all things water in Kentucky and we're always looking for ideas. So if you have a really cool um, idea that you think would be a great topic for our podcast, please share that with us. Or if you'd like to be a guest, we'd be happy to. Um, so I want to um, just wrap up with talking about how to work with Extension. Um, sometimes it's a little um, challenging for folks to do that. And so my recommendations are, first and foremost, to contact the county agents early in the process. So you know where you're going to be working. You identify those county agents. And make sure you maintain open communication with them. As you know, Try not to wait until you're already into the, the throes of your project, and then, then in two weeks you need help from a space or something like that. You know, make sure your agents know from the get-go what is going on with your watershed project. Um, agents can be a great resource, um, but know that once you start contacting owners especially, and especially folks in the agriculture community, they will go to their agent to ask if the agent knows about it. They will ask what the project is, you know, what the agent thinks about it, is it legitimate, is, you know, what's going on. They, you know, the farmers will talk to one another and want to make sure that um, that you keep that communication open, and uh, and also ask how you can collaborate. So, in, uh, our agents, like you probably have, are guessing, can be overwhelmed because of the number of topics that they have to have expertise in, or at least a working knowledge of. And so, coming to them with asking how. You and collaborate or how you can add to an existing program it's a much more gentle way of integrating into their programs and getting them to cooperate with you than going with an ask so you know offering to help something teaching a 4-h class like I mentioned at the environmental camp perhaps that's a way that you can start to work with you um, maybe you can your project will help them reach a new option reach. Uh, but also think about in integrating into one of their existing programs. Some that come to mind, and this is not a, um, an exhaustive list, but you know, master gardeners, companies that have active master gardener groups, um, those folks are not only looking for education and information, but they also are looking for volunteer opportunities. So maybe you have a 
stream buffer you're installing, or maybe you want to put in a rain garden. You need volunteers. Master gardeners often are great folks to contact getting into your project. Um, Master Cattlemen um, is a is a class that uh, it's usually uh, offered in a multi-county format. So you'll have farmers from two or three counties that will cycle through classes and learn more about being how to have a, a healthier um, cattle herd. And part of that includes environmental stewardship. So perhaps you can be part of that environmental stewardship class, or you can offer local information on your watershed project, or be there to just introduce yourself and introduce the project. Um, and then finally, I'd say you can reach out to state specialists. I am certainly here and available and would welcome questions or involvement that you might need to help you make that local contact, but always make the local contact. Even um, Tammy and I, and uh, Suzette does as well, when we get a request for help in a, in a that doesn't come directly from the county extension office, we always loop that agent in so that the agents know what's going on. That's really, that goes back to that open communication with our residents. That's the best way to make sure that you have cooperation. So I'll just direct you to um, some websites. Um, we have, um, like I mentioned, the publications website. And then also there's, uh, we have videos that are on UK Watershed Protection and Restoration YouTube channel. Um, those include the Ag Water Quality Act producer videos and then um, stream restoration videos. That's a lot of the work Carmen Agaritas has done in the past and podcast. So finally, I would just say, if you need to um, locate your local Cooperative Extension Service office, there's a website for that. Um, here's my email address. 